Welcome to episode 37 of the Progression Health Podcast. I'm here with John Flagg. John, do you want to introduce yourself to the listeners? Yeah, Ross, I, I really appreciate you bringing me on, man. Uh, my name is John Flagg. I own a company called Rebuild Stronger. We do online strength coaching and rehab, primarily for powerlifters. We, we do have weightlifters, crossfitters, strongman competitors, military fighters all on the roster, but we really do focus on powerlifters. Um, and that all started a few years ago with my connections with clinical athlete, which we actually talked about before we hopped on air. Um, and background wise, I'm actually a certified athletic trainer. I've been one for going to make myself feel old now, 15 years, 16 years at this point. Um, so I started off as a clinician first and that's where all of this stuff came together. I'm super fortunate to have two awesome staff members. Uh, in Christy Fisher, who's a pelvic floor physiotherapist up in Manitoba, Canada, and Wyatt Christensen, who's an exercise physiologist uh, out in Arizona. He's actually, no, he's in um, Colorado Springs, Colorado now. He just moved. Uh, they helped me out a ton, and I've got just a great team of people that I get to work with every single day. All right, good, yeah. Um, so in terms of like your typical client and, and who you, you work with uh, with your team, who who do you typically like – like to work with who are your favorite clients to work with <laughs> ones that like to communicate a lot um i know the answer is typically like what sport they participate in uh but for me like client or, or coach athlete relationships really important so yes most of the roster is filled up with power lifters and strength athletes but the ones that i really prefer to work with are the ones that want to soak up information they want to be a part of the process, not just be told what to do. Uh, and they're super open to giving and receiving feedback, which to me is one of the most important aspects of, of a good coach athlete relationship. So those are really what I look for in my athletes, uh, as well as, you know, just being a good team fit, which typically means those things. Like communication is key. We have to have hard conversations. If you're willing to do that, then I know you're willing to take the steps to, to get better. All right. So I know that uh, traditionally the kind of typical approach with programming anyway was you know, do three sets, do 10 reps at, you know, hundred kilos. That's your, that's your program there. Do that, you know, as a coach, or I feel like I'll just speak for myself and say, that's kind of typically how I felt like it was. Right. But you're talking a lot about collaboration. So, you know, why, why collaborate with the client and why get their feedback and communication? Because wouldn't that just make more work for everybody involved? I find it makes less, um, because one of the things that a lot of people chase in the industry, whether you're a clinician or a coach is compliance. Compliance is really, really important. Like if your athlete believes in the program, if they believe in what they're doing and they understand what the compliance is probably going to be higher, buy-in is probably going to be higher and results are going to be higher because your athlete can train with intent. Like a great example, you, you mentioned three by 10 and I literally, like when I hear that, I'm like, I just don't want to do that today, right? Especially when you, you're- Too many reps. More, too many reps. Maybe you're a more advanced lifter. Maybe, you know, for me, it's just the intensity for a straight set like that. Just with what I'm lifting now, just it, I, I don't, I don't like the sound of it. But if you said, okay, cool, John, let's do a 10 by three with 60 seconds rest. I'll be like down, done hundred percent. It's the same amount of volume, probably going to use the same amount of intensity. I'm going to have controlled rest intervals. I'm going to get the same amount of work in, but I'm going to actually do it. And like that, that's where that collaborative process comes in. Because if I can get my athletes to train more frequently, train in a way that they enjoy, still work super, super hard. Because it's not like we're, we're not working hard. If somebody tells me like, yeah, I just want to come in and like twiddle around. Now we have to have a hard conversation around like, do you actually want to be where you say you want to be? We get into real coaching. But the collaboration helps compliance. It helps them enjoy the process. And from at least my perspective, a personal belief that I have as a coach is if my lifters ever leave, they should leave as a better lifter than when they started. They go to another coach. I want that coach to go, wow, you're knowledgeable about the process. You understand what's going on because people people don't just leave. The Progression Health Podcast has teamed up with TRX. So TRX is a body weight training piece of equipment that you can hook up anywhere, anytime. And uh, I highly recommend it. I use it in every session with my clients. I use it to warm up and also for stretching. Uh, but if you are traveling, which is where I recommend everyone use it, you know, it's hard to get to a gym. Uh, it's hard to find 
find the time. But you could literally work out from your hotel room with the TRX um, and the door attachment that it has where it doesn't damage the door, but it gives you an effective workout. I also like to add in other things like uh, glute bands and uh, resistance bands. Um, but once you have the TRX, then you can figure all that out. So get yourself 50% off on the TRX home workout equipment with the code Progression Health TRX and boost your workout effectiveness and consistency. Progression Health Podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online therapy service which will help you to more effectively manage your mental health. Mental health is very important and it's something that all of us are realizing now, especially after the pandemic. During the pandemic, for me especially, it was very challenging and I, I reached out to BetterHelp. I uh, tried out a few of their licensed therapists, settled on one for the majority of the pandemic and I found that uh, the help that I received invaluable. And the great thing also is that you can speak to your therapist outside of sessions. Um, if it's not working out, you can switch. Very affordable. It's really easy to use also. Um, and if someone hasn't tried therapy before, but you're kind of, you know, you're curious, I would highly recommend BetterHelp. So what we've done is uh, we've got a sign up link I'll attach in the show notes. And basically you can get a discount to get started and uh, start improving your mental health today. So BetterHelp for better mental health. Leave your services because they're unhappy. There's financial aspects and life aspects. Maybe they have a baby or maybe they got pregnant or maybe they've got like all these other things going on. They got to move and they got to take a break. Okay, cool. If they go with somebody else, that person should be blown away by how well-versed you're at. And that can only happen with, with collaboration. Yeah. I've heard in like psychology that like the therapeutic alliance, so like between the client and the therapist is like yep. the strongest predictor of like, you know, whether someone improves. So yeah, that's like a very interesting point that you make. Um, how do you get like a newbie lift, right? They don't really know three by 10 or they don't know nothing about the gym. How do you get them to kind of figure out what they like? How do you, how do you kind of bring along that collaborative process with somebody who has, you know, not much experience? I'll be honest with you. I think, um, I think the same process applies to very advanced lifters and beginner lifters. There's still going to be some level of experimentation. Now, the entry point, like the door that I start them in may be different. I might start a beginner off with just a super basic structure. You know, everybody makes fun of uh, like five by fives just because, you know, rip a toe falling from grace. But like a five by five is a great starting point for most people. Let's just like see where you're at. Learn the movements, move around like a baby giraffe for a while. Like let's Let's figure it out. And then we can really start to see where, like, what brings results and what do you enjoy doing? An advanced lifter, I'm probably just going to change the entry point. If you start with me and you're like, I've been doing conjugate for 10 years, I'm not just going to go throw you on like a super straight Russian linear progression immediately. Like, let's let's get something that resembles conjugate and let's start pulling stuff out and, and seeing what, what sticks, what you like, what we can change to get that result to go. Because it's going to be experimentation. As a coach... And as, as an athlete, like if you sign up with a coach, something that's really important from an expectation setting standpoint is you should you should at least commit for three months to understand the learning process of what both of you are going to have to go through with each other. If you want behavior change, if you want your movement patterns to change, if you want any of those things, you want to get better, it's going to take three months. It's going to take reps. It's going to take practice. It's going to take all those things. And it is going to take a level of experimentation. Systems are great. And I mentioned conjugate. I mentioned linear periodization, you mentioned all these models, and they help give you guardrails, as a, but they're not an end-all, be-all roadmap every time. So you've got to find those entry points. And with a, a beginner, keep it simple, explain to them like the basics. And I'm talking like basics, basics. You and I were talking, you know, working in like a, a commercial gym and stuff. There's people that don't even know how to like set up the J-hooks or like what the rings on the bar mean, or you say knurling and they're like, what? basic space and just start to introduce them to the system while they start to see results yeah absolutely it's funny i'm actually just kind of reminding myself of how being in the gym like every day i pick up on little things but like a new person to the gym or even someone who's been there a few months that just wouldn't be comfortable or they wouldn't know how to set up or do all these little things that I take for granted. So yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned, you know, some of the, the clients you work with are powerlifters or you do like rehab work. Can you just talk a little bit about like rehab work? Um, what is it and like the importance of it um, or who it's important for? Yeah, uh, really the, the, the company originally started with me primarily rehabbing injured powerlifters back to the platform. Um, my mission as a, as a clinician and a coach has always been to get people to better understand, and I know we're probably going to touch on this a little bit later, but uh, I've had a bunch of whole, old heads come into the clinic, and, and as I was coming up, they just tell you that the sport itself like wears you down, and it's not a personal belief of mine. I've seen 80-year-old people comp compete at Worlds. Smart training, but I want people to understand that they can, they can do, they can lift, they can power lift, they can Olympic lift for generations. And it truly can be one of the things that can keep you healthy. That's what, that's where it started. 
It was like, okay, I'm an injured power lifter. I need help. Clinicians don't understand me because I walk in the door and I'm like, yeah, hurt this. I just want to get back to deadlifting 600 pounds. And people look at you like you're crazy. They're like, why would you want to do that? And I'm the guy that goes, man, that sounds like an awesome goal. Like, let's figure out what that, like, how we can actually get. And I think one of the interesting pieces to this is that a lot of people look at they hear rehab, they hear physical therapy, and they think like little green TheraBand and lightweights. But really, my personal belief is it's just activity modification. Let's let's find what hurts. Let's work around that while still finding ways for you to train. So if it, the most common one is people are like, yeah, my, my back hurts. Let's find a range of motion or an intensity like weight on the bar that is tolerable. While we do that, let's look at the rest of your life. I already tell you right now, when lockdowns happened and I went from being on my feet all day long to sitting in a chair for eight hours, like, yeah, it hurt my back too. Uh, that was a piece where my philosophy is, okay, let, let's find a way to train. Let's load those tissues and rehab you back until the, the point where when it's time to lift again, you haven't been so disconnected from it that it seems foreign because Things like that actually increase injury risk more than the movements themselves. And let's let's build that momentum so you still have also the mental reward of the activity that you love. You may not be able to deadlift the way you want to right now, but you will in the future and very quickly. And when you finally can, it's not going to feel like you've got training wheels on, like when you were first deadlifting. So that's kind of the approach we take is taking people from injury getting like figuring out ways for them to continue to train until they're ready to fully train and then taking them from that point into the performance realm. Got it. Yeah. So I want to ask about external factors, but first of all, I think a lot of, you know, like somebody listening, right. They'll do the deadlift, do the squat, whatever, you know, whatever exercise, they'll get injured and they'll be like, right, that's the problem that's going out unfinished, you know, I'm not doing, you know, the bench again or whatever. What, what are your thoughts around the movement that got you injured, where you got injured, and, you know, how to proceed with that movement in your training? Okay. So, of course, we go over this for clinicians. So this is a pretty, pretty streamlined way to think about it. You have to find out what the actual triggers are. So people look at it like, we use deadlift again, as because that's the one that everybody's... Scared. So everybody says, oh, it's the deadlift. So, but what about that? Was it the range of motion of that deadlift? Was it the volume that you did that day? Like, did, did you do a rack of volume? I know a guy right now was getting after it, getting after it, getting after it, and then decided to do like this CrossFit workout that was five sets of five at 90%, and he just wasn't ready. Like, that's a lot of volume. Was it the intensity? Is everything okay up to 100 kilos? And then as soon as you put five more on, like, ah, this is starting to get pain. Or is it the frequency? Are you okay? Can you recover well deadlifting once a week? And then as soon as you slide that second day of deadlift in, like, back doesn't recover from day to day we have to find those it's not the lift itself what goes into it and that's when you have to start digging in deeper because at that point you can then start to choose and yeah some of those things spill into each other right like it may be hurts just off the floor and it hurts once i get three reps in okay cool as a coach what i'm going to select is a two inch block so i get rid of that first little bit of range of motion and all we're going to do is doubles. We may do eight doubles. All we're going to do is doubles. And now all of a sudden you're back to deadlifting pain-free or at least at a tolerable level that you can see progress and see yourself get better. Because we're not aggravating it every single So what people tend to do is they take the baby in the bathwater and they chuck it out a window while they're driving 70 miles an hour. And they're like, yeah, I'm just never going to deadlift. Instead, find the entry point. But you got to break it down into more than just the entire movement itself as being like the all encompass There's so many variables that go into it. You have to explain. Absolutely. So many variables. So like, let's say somebody is a little bit scared of the deadlift, right? And, you know, we could even talk about why people get injured in the deadlift as well, but they get injured in the deadlift and they're just like, you know, what the hell do I do? Of course, their only option feels like to stop deadlifting, you know? So uh, what would you say to somebody who's kind of like, I guess, a little bit hesitant about going back deadlifting specifically after, you know, they tweaked their back? Okay. So there's, there's two really, really important, like, qualification. Number one, is it actually worth it? This is something that's really important. And I think, uh, I know we're going to talk possibly about the Kevin Bass, but you know, for me, everybody sees the Robert Overs posted posts and stuff like that with any, and this is what I find super interesting about lifting. We have NFL football players that get cracked in the head and people are like, yeah, you signed up for it though. Like they just don't care. You know what I mean? We've got, now you're starting to see incidents of CTE in soccer players internationally because they're taking headers like crazy. So, but it, like general public goes, yeah, but you signed up for it and you're getting paid and you're doing all this stuff. So it's fine for my entertainment. It's okay. But as soon as somebody gets hurt at a really high level of lifting, they're like, oh, idiot. Look at them. Can't do that. 
The thing is, is all those people signed off on that level of risk. The higher you get in performance, the higher you get in standing. Like I always use Ray Williams as an example. Like Ray squatting a thousand pounds, guys. Like there's not a, a large margin for error. The risk becomes very, very high, but he signed off. He said, I'm okay with it. What I do in the gym, I'm okay with. I've signed off on it. And like, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mentioned this last night in another show. I'm at the level right now where I'm getting to a point where I'm going to have to sign off on additional risk because my training has to be similar. So my first question to people, if they're apprehensive is, okay, cool. Is it worth it to you to bring that back into your training? If you're a power lifter, the resounding, the resounding answer is typically a yeah. Most people are like, yeah, I want to get back to deadlifts. I want to get back to competing. There's no such thing as a squat push. <laughs> like, no, you have to deadlift. So people are like, yeah, okay, cool. So that's barrier number one. If it's a no, all right, cool. We can figure out whatever else you want to do. We can figure out what your next goal is, and we can, we can achieve that, however we want to achieve. Once that happens, and once you say yes, now we have to navigate other things. We mentioned the training aspect of it, but we also have to understand there are days where you're going to be fearful. There are days when you're going to come in and it, you know it's going to be a little bit more sore. You're going to have to make more modifications and you're going to have to change things around that it's not going to be a straight line. Just like training's never a straight line. That's the other piece that's always funny. It's like, yeah, my strength goes up and down and that's normal, but like injury, I should just go in a straight line and recover like a robot. No, it's going to be up and down. understand that. There's going to be days where it's, but the key is just like when you were super healthy and you felt tired, you felt banged up and you stayed up and watched too much Netflix last night, you still drug your, your ass to the gym. And when you're done, you're like, oh man, I feel great. I don't regret going to that, for that workout. Same mentality. You have to come in with that approach. Yeah. Way at it. Because reps are going to make you feel better. Reps are going to make you feel more confident. You have, you have to break the expectation. The expectation is I'm going to pull this and it's lights out. Make good choices, modify the way you have to. And what you'll do is you'll pull it and it won't. And then you go, oh, that felt good. Lock it up as a win. Yeah, I feel as though, the, uh, you know, keep moving forward and, and kind of modify your approach. It's like, that's just such a useful way to approach something like a deadlift where, you know, maybe it was the barbell that caused the injury, use dumbbells, use a Smith machine, use whatever you have to, but uh, modify um, so you, you mentioned external factors that go into an injury, right? So we're in the gym, get injured on the deadlift, doing the barbell, but what are external factors outside of that setting that might have, you know, played into the pain, the injury that you feel? And there's so many, there's so many that like, even from a scientific standpoint, we don't know all of them yet. And we don't even know the magnitude that they actually, uh, one mindset though, that I do find to be really prevalent. And this, this is more common decades of people thinking this way, is it? It's, it's physical activity that leads to injury, period. And if you look at any of any recent studies, especially along like low back pain and those sorts, a greater indicator of pain incidence is a sedentary lifestyle. So, say, say that again. Say that again. That's, uh, that's an important point. A, a higher prevalence of injury or pain comes from a sedentary lifestyle. So you're, so movement, exercise, working out, that is going to cause a lower risk of injury. Than protective. Protective. Okay. Then, you know, just doing nothing, we'll say. Being inactive. Yep. yep. And everybody understands, like, you go for a walk, you go for a run, like, your heart adapts, your blood pressure goes down, like, these health markers happen. But then, like, then they think that, oh, but if I lift weights, I'm going to get all this wear and tear on my joints. Like, adaptation only happens in my heart. No, the rest of your body adapts in the same way. So if you train, if you lift, if you exercise, your body's going to adapt to those loads, and it's going to bolster itself. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, walk load load your skeletal system and it will respond by creating more bone it will hypertrophy your bone ligaments hypertrophy muscle hypertrophies tendons hypertrophy granted all at different rate right bone ligament tendon very very small like very slow i put muscle hypertrophy rate that everybody thinks about that comes from load the body will adapt and you will be you will get protective effects of, of activity but what people do and i'm sure you i'm sure you've done this in a, in a session somebody comes in they're like oh man i'll tell you what after yesterday it, we did an upper body session i know but my hamstring just is killing me like, okay cool that i understand completely and all you did was like bench press and rows and like a couple pull downs and then some shoulder work and you, you got him out of the gym right most of it was seated so you're like i don't understand what's going on with your hamstring well then they tell you yeah but you know i, I went and 
I, I was driving around, had a whole bunch of stops. I was getting in and out of my car. I think it was probably like 30 or 40 times. I'm not used to that. Okay. So you thought it was in the gym that something happened, but you got in and out of your car 40 times. Wait a second. Like, let's talk about this. Let's talk about out of the gym activity level. Let's talk about staying up and binge watching Ozark. Let's talk about like your, your Apple TV subscription. Let's talk about your drinking hat. Let's talk about like the food quality that you, how frequently you're eating or not eating, how many meals you skip, what's your work stress look like? How, what's it sound like? And what's it feel like when your 17 year old daughter is screaming at you before you have to go to the gym? You know what I mean? Like these are all factors that are actually going to impact not just performance, but recovery. And we just brush them off. We're like, ah, this doesn't matter. Like if, if you're in the middle of going through a nasty divorce, guess what? Training recovery is going to suck. And your injury rate is probably going to go up because of those factors, not what you're doing in the gym. It all it all adds up. All the stress adds up. It's just, I guess, it's not as obvious as uh, the workouts in the gym, all that other stuff that you just mentioned coming into it. Well, really, it gets tall. Um, I love, I just want to jump in real quick. People do actually like put you stress and distress into two columns. Like you stress is stress that you can adapt to and improve upon. And distress is like detrimental. The divorce that I mentioned, right? The thing is though, like we can do that in our brain. That sounds off, but your body doesn't know that. It's just stress. It's just something that it has to respond. And most of the time, it's going to respond in fight or flight. It's going to dump a bunch of cortisol into your bloodstream and ask you for energy resources to recover. And sometimes it's just too much. So that all adds up. Yes, it may be you stress. Going to the gym is is beneficial. It, you'll adapt to it. It'll be great. But like chronic low levels of work stress you don't adapt to, you don't get better at, at dealing with a toxic work environment. So those things add up. And basically when those, you've got that, that distress that's sitting there in that, in that cup and filling it up 80% every single day, and you walk in with an 80% full cup every single day, you've not got a lot of room to pour more in. And people just love to, oh yeah, let's drop this in there. More, yeah, it, it can really add up. Like I, I'm just thinking about two weeks ago, I was like, oh, I'm super motivated. I'll do a bit of extra work, whatever. And, you know, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll just, you know, get my sleep or whatever. And like, you know, the next day I was like absolutely zapped from staying up that little bit later. And uh, I just like had to take a nap. Like I literally could not function without like taking a nap because my body was telling me like, you know, slow down. So like, uh, yeah, all the stress adds up. Even if you invite it into your life and say like, oh, I can do this a little bit more. Or I can take it. It's like, yeah, you can't take it off. Dude, that's the bomb, by the way. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> They're essential. Uh, it just uh, depends how you use them. Exactly. The tricky part is not overdoing them where they become like a second sleep in the day. Exactly. You can't Like, why am I sleeping for eight hours at one o'clock in the afternoon? And all of a sudden, I'm night shift. I don't get it. That would be a bomb, a bomb laugh right there. Um, it would. So, so one of your posts you had online, and it's kind of everything we're talking about here, is, is the barbell. So you had a post, why I love the barbell. So why... Do you love, you know, the barbell? Why do you love barbell training? And you're like, what does it do for you? The barbell for me in particular has done many. Um, I owe the barbell the current life that I live. Like, I know this is an audio only podcast, but if you were to look behind me, I've got a large variation of barbells on the wall. Um, I'm a coach. This is my profession. This is my life. It's put me in a position to not only coach other athletes, but coach other business professionals to build their own businesses and taught my family, myself, massive lessons throughout learning about it. Just like most people would say about whatever sport, there's Hall of Fame speeches in the NFL, in baseball, in basketball, volleyball, it doesn't matter the sport. Like those people are always going to tell you this sport is my life. It taught me so much. So for me, that was the barbell. That was Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting. And it, it has legitimately changed my life. But one of the reasons I love the barbell in particular is because of its accessibility. Everything is a tool. Like if we want to bring it all the way down to like finite levels, the kettlebell, dumbbells, uh, a loading pin, like landmine attachments for like all this, they're all tools. But for me, from a, a training perspective, there's not many things that are as brutally simple as a barbell that you can load as efficient. Dumbbells are great. They have limitations. Kettlebells are great. They have limitations. The barbell is amazing. It also has limitations, but... You can load it in a balanced manner, overload the hell out of it. Like, yeah, if you want to squat 100 kilos, <laughs> my suggestion is to put it on a bar. Because if you want to pick up a 100 kilo dumbbell, <laughs> you're going to put yourself in a funky position. So it allows such variability in training in such a simple way. Plus, on top of that, outside of the fact that like 
most gyms also have an extensive rack of, you can pretty much go into any gym in the country and find, it may not be in the best condition. It may not be the power bar that you love, you know, it meets, but it's a barbell. Can't say the same for kettlebell practitioners because I, I think kettlebell sports actually amazingly fascinating. Um, it's a super, super cool thing, but like how many gyms actually have a good wide variety of competition level kettlebell or even just something that's a very few. Can you modify it with a dumbbell? Sure. Like who's going to do a snatch test with a 50 pound dumbbell? Not going to be great. So that's why I prefer the barbell as a tool. Plus there's just something badass about it, man. Like it, once, once I've, I've had so many older women come and work with me, 76, 78, you know, 80 years old. And as soon as they're able to get a bar on their back and squat it, like just throw them in a phone booth and they're going to pop out a Superman. Like, I just don't understand the light in their eyes just goes so bright. Uh, and I've only seen it really happen with the barbell. So that that's why that's where my bias is. I understand there's other tools. There's a bunch of people that absolutely love them. My love is with the barbell. I'm not going to apologize for it. Yeah. Unapologetically, uh, big favorite of the barbell. And I think it's the most efficient way to lift as well, you know, to get strong. And like, there's loads of other ways like the kettlebell or like dumbbells, but you know, uh, if you only had to pick one. And of course, I, I don't know many people who only use the barbell. You know, it's like, uh, it's, it's always going to be, nearly always going to be a combination of the barbell plus great tool. And I love that with clients to see, you know, the look on their face when they kind of do something they don't, you know, uh, expect to do. You know, they lift that that heavy weight or they, they you know, get that, that PR. It's just like, it's like nothing else. So that's, yeah, really a great feeling. It is, man. I love seeing them. That's the best part of the day in their day kind of yeah so we're, we're kind of talking a lot about like the psychology of, of training and like your mindset and kind of just like talking about how things are going as opposed to just like blindly going in and moving uh, so another post you had was uh, a bad day of fishing is still a good day so it, it's a very kind of like psychological or meta sort of thought so could you explain that a little bit and how it relates to training well i mean you know the, the root of that saying is, is that yeah you might not have caught anything but you still got to go fishing you know what i mean like it's it's a very old man adage i'm not gonna lie i get it uh but the same thing happens with the barbell a, a bad day of training doesn't have to be the end of the world and we have done an excellent job a, a, you know not not a positive job by the way but an excellent job at romanticizing like the grind no days off and like everything has to be perfect but that's just not how life works in reality so we have to maintain perspective that in a lot of instances, it may have been a bad day, but we're still blessed to be able to do something. We still walked through a bunch of barriers just to get started. We still got our butt in the gym. We still did the things that we were supposed to. And they might not have been super optimal. And they might not have been exactly what we wanted to that day. But even when you're fatigued, even, even when you're tired, when you go in and you still do the work, then you're going to see results. It's the people who are able to stack those bricks up the highest that start to, to really see the benefits of it. I've been training for 20 years at this point. Do I remember workouts that I skipped? No, but I remember the ones where I was like, man, I, I don't want to do this. And I went in and did it anyway. And didn't do it anyway and happy with it. <laughs> like, like I walked out and I was like, man, I'm glad I did that. But that, that workout kind of sucked. But I'd, I'd much rather do that than not do it at all. Than not have been able to have the opportunity to go fishing. Yeah, you raise a really interesting pot in my head so you're, you're talking about not kind of grinding through which is like another point you made you don't want to you know white knuckle it or just sort of like um, ignore how you feel completely or your life starts or anything like that but how do you explain like the process of working out on the days you don't feel like it you know like how do you as someone who's worked out for 20 years how do you get yourself to the gym or get yourself moving um and doing the thing you want to do right when you just don't, for whatever reason, you know, like, you know, all the external factors we spoke of already, they, they come up as they, they naturally do in life. How do you almost, I guess, like put them to the side and just get to uh, your workout? I think the big key here is, is how you actually approach this. So years ago, Jim Wendler, who I'm still a big fan of, uh, wrote an elite FTS article. It might've been in, in one of the 531 books about punch the clock. But there's just days you got to go in and punch the clock. And that started to resonate with me, but you can still take a grind mentality. And you know what I mean? You can still put the world on your back and I'm going to be, this, this is going to be tough. And, you know, I, <laughs> I think a lot of people admire, but also greatly misunderstand David Goggins. It's just being like a complete masochist and they take that role and they just start like beating the crap out of themselves like all the time. Sorry, you're not trying to be a Navy SEAL. 
All right. Like this is lifting weights. So the approach instead and what I is to understand that, all right, what I have, like my main goal when it comes to training is to maintain momentum. I don't go in or I skip that workout or I, I don't come in with any level of the likelihood I lose momentum is higher. Do I lose results? No, probably not. Whatever that may be. I just want to maintain momentum, but I'm not doing it in spite of something. I'm not doing it in spite of my fatigue or there's no, there's no enemy. And I think that's where people go wrong because they have this enemy. And then when you introduce enemy, you introduce the man, one of these days, that enemy is going to win. And now you've actually taken your own momentum and stifled it even more because now you've got guilt. Now you've got shame. Now you got all these other emotions that shouldn't even be part of the process. Like, why are they even there? You don't even need to introduce them. Think about it as, all right, got to keep momentum. I'm going to go in. Maybe you've taken a hiatus, right? Maybe, so I mentioned this behind me. It took five months for this to happen, for my basement to get finished and for me, us to get like our gym down here the way I wanted it to be. I lost a ton of training momentum because I didn't, I didn't actually have even space available to train for like two months. And I was hodgepodge and stuff at local commercial gyms, like trying to put stuff together. And the first day back when this was put together, yeah, I was excited, but it was after a long day of work, I felt beat. And the only thing I thought to myself was, okay, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. Not I need to do this. I want to do this because this is going to be my first step in building momentum. Okay. And I did it. I did the workout and it sucked. <laughs> Everything felt heavy. And the next day I did it again, a bit more momentum. And after about a week, I'd gotten back to a good groove. And two, three weeks later, I'm hitting PRs again and doing the thing. But I never like, I never put put extra weight on my back or extra emotion on my back. Like that, this, this is not something you need to introduce. The concept of momentum is so interesting. Like, it's almost like this just inexplainable, like just internal drive or push you have. And I was like, I, I went for a run yesterday evening and I was trying to explain to myself or think to myself, why am I doing this run? And I, I'm all, it, it wasn't a PR. It wasn't fast. It was not, it was short. It was, it was slow. It was actually pretty challenging because it was kind of like sore and stuff. And uh, I was like, you know, why am I doing this? And it's just momentum was carrying me through. It's kind of like almost as though it's the person I become, you know? So it's kind of like, this is, you know, I'm a health professional or whatever I want to call myself. And if that's who I am, then I need to be physically active. And I don't need to be like hardcore and like setting a PR all the time. But, you know, I have to do something. I have to do what I can. So yeah, it's just, it's kind of like, I can't, it's almost hard to put words to. And it's definitely the opposite of like, oh, I have this uh, sort of uh, something I'm fighting against as well. It's not that. But it is, I guess it's just character. It's kind of like a character type of thing. What would you think of that? Well, I, I 100% agree. And the way I've tried to visualize it lately, um, you, you always hear about like building a house, right? Like each workout's a brick. And that's cool. But nobody actually thinks about how they actually treat those bricks. Like, yes, maybe now with like modern technology and stuff. I, I still don't believe this is actually true. But there, not every brick is completely uniform and perfect. Would you agree? It's got to be. It's got to be some error in there, especially with humans. Yeah, there's variation in there, right? Yeah. So imagine like you're building a house, and each one of your workouts is a brick. Now, but you're actually like molding that brick yourself. And then what happens is you put that up, put that brick there, and then occasionally you decide to just take that thing and like throw it in the yard because you weren't happy, or to smack it with a hammer really hard because you're going to talk shit about yourself and the way you executed or the way you, you know, whatever. Oh, this run was too slow. And now that that brick that you just built that you put up on the on the house has cracks in it because you just decided to be negative around it. And then the next one, right? There's a brick that's next to it, but now those two have to sustain each other from like an actual physics structural like engineering state. And you took you took time to actually smash a bunch of now imagine how much like if you if you build that wall over a year. And you do this on a frequent basis, like how structurally sound is that going to be? Why not? So maybe you should not like, A, chuck bricks into the yard because it's just going to slow the process. And B, maybe you should find wins instead of smashing 50% of your workouts because of some unrealistic expectation that you have of yourself and your brain. Build it solid. Some of them are going to be a little nubby. You know, some of them are going to be super pretty, but standing together, they'll be able to create a strong wall. There's no reason for you to sit there and go out of your way to, to bust half. Kind of instead of grinding, it's kind of like your, you know, heroic deed was to like not, you know, call it quits on the, you know, the little streak you built up or the commitment you'd made to yourself or the house you're building. Like, you know, instead of like throwing that brick away, your, your PR for the day, that just that single day was like, I didn't just smash the brick and let out all my anger and like, you know, uh, not stay aligned to like who I am or the commitment I made to myself, but I just 
you know, I got to, uh, I got to the gym and I just did what I could. That was huge because I had, you know, you had 101 reasons to, to quit, you know? So yeah, it's, that's, that's the kind of the beauty of working out. It becomes so much more than just like moving the barbell from like A to B. Well, there's so many aspects to it. And one of the reasons I'm so critical, I want to make this super clear too. One of the reasons I'm so critical of grind culture and like that whole thing around it is it actually eliminates evaluation. You just kind of go like, I have to do this. So you go blindly and people don't ever really take a step back and go, wait, why is this not working? For like if it's a grind, if it's that hard to like get yourself up to do some of these things, like, okay, we have to actually stop, take a second, reevaluate the process here and find out where the gaps are to actually make this something that's better and sustainable because grinding has zero level of sustainability to it removes evaluation and you never actually look and say, how do I improve on this? And that's why, in my personal opinion, especially for strength sports, people burn out in two to three years. It's because they're grinding and they never stop to learn and evaluate how to make the process. Yeah, that, that, that brings up my next question then. So the exercise is tough, you know, even though like, you know, I've been working out for like, you know, however many years and you've been working out for 20. It's still, it's not like it's, it's easy, but um, how do you make the process better for people who find it like especially hard? Who have like, let's say somebody's listening, right? And they have like zero motivation, but like they actually, they still want to be active and, and work out and they would like to be stronger or fitter. You know, how do they make the process of exercise, of regular exercise better for them? You gotta connect to a better why. I think that's what it really comes down to. And to be honest with you, people just need to be more fucking honest with themselves. I'm sorry, I probably just got you a big E next no, to the all project, good. But out. I hear this all the time. I hear it in business owners a ton, right? Well, or, or soon to be business. Like their first goal is to leave their current job. And then as soon as they leave their job, they're like, okay, now what? You know what I mean? Like it, it, they, they lose that little bit and they, they kind of get lost because the, the why isn't big enough. So you hear goals like this all the time and I, I understand it. It's they're, they're popular, they're prevalent. I want to get stronger or, you know, I want to lose weight. Why? Uh, John Berardi is actually, I'm a huge fan of, of John and what he did, especially in the early days of precision nutrition. And he talks about the five why. And it's not multiple different variations of why. It's literally just asking yourself why five times. I want to lose weight. Why? Uh, because I think I weigh. Why? Oh, because, you know, my doctor said I've, I've got, I've got to lose 30. Why? I was, you know. Because it's actually really negatively impacting my health. Why? Well, I want to be around for my kids and I want to see them graduate high school and I want to see them get married and I want to see them actually do that. Now we have a reason. Now we have an actual, it's not this nebulous, like non-specific thing. I hate smart goals. I think they're stupid because people have overblown them, but you really need to, to connect to a deeper why. Do you want to get stronger? I can tell you, I can tell you right now, the first reason why I wanted to get into strength training wasn't to just get stronger. It was to feed my own ego and feel better about myself than I did at the time because I had low self-esteem. I wasn't confident in myself. I didn't feel like I was athletically as gifted as the other people. I, I wanted to find a way to have that vent and find something to work. And it fed that. And then the, the, the why got bigger and bigger and bigger as time went on. But it took me a long time to get honest with that. And once I was honest with it, like that's when I just, this became life. You know what I mean? And in a positive way, people, people say like, oh, what do you mean? What'd you give up? I didn't give up anything. It just became something that was a non-negotiable. Everything's built around it in a really positive way. And, and yeah, really, I really positive way. I saw it, you know, it's not all about like uh, what you achieve, but like you've squatted like over 500 pounds, which is like a lot, like probably closer to six I've, I've seen. And like just the, the confidence and the knowledge you have right now, it's like, it's telling, you know, it's kind of like you got honest. And then he got results kind of thing, you know, but you have to like stick at it for a long time. Yep. A really long time. I mean, I remember, I remember a lot of milestones throughout the process. I remember the first time I squatted four. I remember the first time I squatted five. I remember the first time I squatted six. I remember how long I was stuck at 644. I remember the first time I squatted seven. I remember the first time I had eight on my back. I've had 850 uh, in a suit before. I've done like all those things. I remember all those milestones. And I think the really interesting part is, and, and this is for listeners to understand. I remember when I was at 100. I remember when I was at 200. Like I remember those moments too. Never forget where you came from either. And the, the, the wildest part, that giant, scary dude at the gym that you see like looking at you occasionally, isn't judging. He's just waiting for you to come and ask for a little bit of help because he's dying to actually be able to share knowledge. Like they just want to help. Most of the people that have been like gym rats forever, they don't want to impose the, the good ones, right? They're just like, they love this thing and they're waiting for somebody to be like, Hey man, can you spot me? And they'll be like, hell yeah, let's go do this. Sorry, small, small tangent. Yeah, but no, to get stronger, to get, you know, uh, anywhere with, with, with your working out, it's like, 
takes a lot of work. So if someone asks you about it, like you're going to have a lot to say. So yeah, definitely ask people who, you know, they are aware you want to get to in terms of strength and, and mus- muscular development, stuff like that. Yeah. Just kind of like uh, trying to figure out exactly why you're doing it. Like just for example, for me, I, like using that kind of Socratic questioning of asking yourself all the whys, like uh, for me, it kind of came down to just, you know, I think I have this belief that I'm like weak. I'm not sure where it came from. I guess it doesn't really matter. But then I go in and I have a really good workout and it doesn't have to be again like the PR or I don't have to grind through or anything like that. But if I just move some weight around, get my heart rate up or do something challenging, physically exerting, then I'm like, you know, I'm at least, maybe I'm not strong. Maybe I haven't gone from weak to strong, but I'm at least, I can say for certain that I'm stronger than what I thought I was when I walked into a uh, gym. And that's the beauty of, you know, kind of like the barbell and, and regular exercise you know, as a whole. Well, and that's where people do need to take the next step because you can actually get stuck in that mental process for an extended period of time. And that's why perspective is so important. You know, I, I didn't mention what I can lift from an ego standpoint. It's because I remember those those phases of my life and where I was and where I've come from. It's really important to be able to kind of readjust your internal viewpoint of of self-worth because a lot of people do start the journey off with a very low like that's a very low point for them but you don't want to stay in it because then you get really really strong and you see those those results and you see those things but your self-worth is still really really low you have to re- readjust that barometer as you go through the process and this is where it got really popular for a while there for people to really only talk about process orientation and be like you just gotta love the journey you just gotta love the workout yeah but you also have to see result to have that reset of barometer. So the, the two things do go hand in hand. You have to take successes. You have to, to take results and then use those results to remodify your, your own personal self-belief. Because if you don't, then you'll still be stuck where you were two or three years ago and, and wondering like, why am I doing all this? Yeah, that goes back to the point of being honest with yourself. Like if you're not, you know, motivated or happy with, you know, your exercise routine or your level of fitness, it's like, well, maybe you're not making the, the progress or getting the results that you know you can make. And that's why you're unhappy. You're not like, you're not being your best and you could, you know, uh, reevaluate, get a different perspective, uh, get back to the drawing board and plan out like a, a different approach to get you the results you deserve. Just some, some other posts you had. So uh, we're, we're talking about like, you know, thinking about lifting and, and working out. What are some thoughts that uh, people should have or maybe like single, you know, points to think about when they are lifting, when they're doing like the squat bench or the deadlift? Man, there, that can be a really context dependent question, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think the number one thing that when people enter a training session, regardless of, of what, if they're going to do that particular day, you have to have a singular focus on getting better at something, right? Whether that's like, I want to, I want to not just hit a weight PR here or there. I want to execute. I want to make it so my warm ups move smoother. You, that's how you also find win. So when you enter a training session, number one thing on your mind should be what's my win going to be today? What's the most important thing for me to achieve? And understand that it's not always going to be just lifting up. When it comes to, in particular, squat, bench, and deadlift, if we're talking about power lifters here, if, if you're coming up in a meet, you want to hit the numbers that are prescribed. You want to do all those things, but your number one thing is to ex- execute, 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 execute. You've got guardrails put on you by an RPE or percentage or something like that. Like you need to hit standard. You need to keep technique tight and efficient, not from an injury standpoint, but from a training standpoint, we want things to be efficient. You need to hit your spots. You need to execute. And those are the things that become really important. Move with intent. Have like have intentions. It's not just coming through and going through the motions. Like get get the things done you need to get done. And you can take that into bad days and good days. Because if you dictate those and you get done what you can get done and you move with intent, you're going to have a, a positive yeah, if you uh, kind of uh, don't have intent with what you're doing, if you go in and you're just kind of randomly, you know, moving about, you're going to get random results. And that's going to be a surefire way to be demotivated and just, you know, not be uh, happy with what you're getting. Well, did you see that? Um, I don't have the reference here. Did you see that paper, though, about walking with intent versus just general walking no, and like it's improvement on cardiovascular health and weight. Absolutely. So there's a study. I'll have to find it. Um, it's It's going all over Instagram. I think it was like one or two weeks ago. Uh, where they took subjects and one of them, they had like an actual planned walk and the other ones, like the control group just had their normal daily NEPA, you know, because I mean, as, as coaches and trainers and, and clinicians, we've always talked about NEPA, non-exercise physical activity and how important it is. But they found that the walking group that had like an actual planned intentful walk saw greater results in cardiovascular health and weight loss and higher calorie burn than the other with steps and like time walking adjust. So intent means a lot. Intent 
matters. Like if you want to move a bar as fast as humanly possible, you have to do that. If you want to be super strong, you have to move those things maximum. Not like, oh, I'm just getting reps in, you know, doing the thing. Like that's not how you get strong. You have to move with intent. And you can add in so much more intent or so much more meaning or purpose to what you're doing if you just kind of look in the right places or you think about it a little bit more or even, you know, something simple as like you plan, you know, if you just plan, uh, that can go so, so far. Yep. Agreed. Uh, so you just mentioned injuries there. Um, and you know, you do a bit of a rehab work. That's probably like your, your primary work. So one of your other posts was, uh, there are many ways we can reduce pain. So what are some of the ways that, uh, we can reduce pain? Um, is pain completely avoidable? Is pain a sign that something is wrong? You know, what, what's the story with pain? Pain is one of the most complex subjects. You can do an entire series of podcasts strictly on pain. Um, a buddy of mine actually has an entire course on, pain. uh, but I'm going to answer one of these questions first. And that is, is pain avoidable? It is not in any way, shape, or form avoidable. Now, let me qualify and give a little bit of detail as to what I mean. Pain is a normal survival mechanism. It can exist within an environment where there's tissue damage and when there is not. And that's one of the things where I think a lot of people go, what? That like, you've raised a couple of eyebrows. Like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Pain can exist when no damage exists. It is a threat response from the body and the brain saying, whoa, 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 whoa. What is We've seen it. On multiple occasions, some of the largest studies on low back pain, taking people with massive amounts of disability, massive amounts of, of inability to move or anything like that, have completely clear MRIs or MRI scans that wouldn't indicate anything malicious. Then you have these people that are walking around, competing, working, no pain, doing their thing with like miserable MRIs. <laughs> like you look at it and you go, oh my God, how are you alive? Please, please, please sit down. Please sit down. So pain can exist in the absence of damage. So that's like one of the first things for people to understand. Reasons that pain is unavoidable is because of those reasons. It's a normal human experience. You stub your toe, like you're, you're, all those things are going to happen. You're going to get a toothache. If you train long enough, you're going to sustain some level of injury from training. Like it, it, It's just going to happen because you cannot control literally all the factors that contribute to pain. But when it happens, what are some things that we can do to help mitigate it, manage it in a better, better sense? First and foremost, if there's a key to pull out of all the, all the big words that I just said, it's that pain is normal. We've treated it as abnormal. We've treated it as this like huge, terrible, big elephant in the room. It's not. It's a normal part of life. I mean, I'm sure there's everybody listening at some point has like been sitting in a chair and like the side of their leg just starts randomly hurting. And you're like, hell is that? It just happens. So don't panic. Something happens in the gym. Something happens at home. So don't panic. Breathe first. Assess. Okay. What's well, going on? The next piece, move as best as possible. And I cannot exp- like express this enough movement can be extraordinarily extraordinarily beneficial because like i said before pain is a threat risk what you have to do is get the threat level to come down by like let, let's use your finger as an example right ask your finger in a door the whole thing hurts you don't want to move as time goes on you start to explore those ranges of motion and they don't hurt you go okay i'm good through like then you hit the spot that it does hurt okay now i know where the, the boundaries but if you never moved it you would just stick your finger straight out indefinitely for god only knows how long until it completely stops hurting and you lose function there. so move as best you can through it i always say like keep it tolerable the reason i use tolerable is because everybody has their own sense of pain and distress and then lastly don't be afraid to tell somebody. Don't, don't be afraid to tell your friend, your training partner, a clinician, something like that. Don't be afraid to actually voice that you're in pain. It's like, hey, this hurts. All right, cool. Because that'll give somebody else to help you figure it out. Like those are the big three things. Don't panic. Move as best you can as early as you can tell somebody. No need to suffer in silence. That's really effective because I find, I think I see it a lot of, uh, in a lot of other people, but also myself when I... You know, hurt something, the instant reaction is to catastrophize and then to kind of like pull back and be like, oh, you know, I can't do that or I can't move or whatever. And then to just sort of like maybe uh, hold it in and be like, you know, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll white knuckle it. I'll, I'll get through this. I'll be fine. So it's kind of, it's almost like the typical reaction can be, or just in myself, is the opposite of the advice you gave, but the advice is very effective and it makes it makes much better sense. And I know that when I recover well, for example, I had a shoulder injury, uh, I've applied that and, it, and the results bear out. Like it really does improve the recovery process. Well, and it also allows you learning. Options. You know, if you if you do this stuff for long enough, if you train for long enough, you'll start to find that you have options because 
you're going to come in and everybody's going to have their own lightning rods, right? We always use low back pain as like an example. That's because 80% of the population is going to have low back pain. It's, it's, it, that's a normal human experience. But like I played rugby for years. I wrestled for years. I still do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I do all this stuff. And from old sports injuries, my left knee occasionally will just be 80, 38. Okay, I'm not like 12 anymore. So when I come down to the gym and I've got a squat heavy that day, I've got like 12 strategies to get around. Okay, let's let's try tier number one, the thing that typically works every single time. Let me do that. Up, oh, didn't work today. Now I'm gonna try number two. And that all happened from that checklist I just said. I didn't, I don't panic. Keep moving, figure out what I can actually do, and let me tell somebody. That way I can start to troubleshoot and create my own roadmap of what that will look like in the future because now I have the opportunity to learn how to get around. And if you do that, you can start to accumulate knowledge and now it's not a big deal at all because what most people, what happens with most people, let's take your shoulder as an example. If like a couple of weeks later you did it again, you're going to be like, shit, I'm not going to do anything. And that can be a moment that stops the learning process. So take that time, learn about it, figure out ways to work around it. So then in the future you have options because having options is the situation it could dictate a few different approaches you know trial and error experimentation whereas if you just have the one option you know uh if you only have one of the three options that you gave then you're pretty limited uh, yep. but then uh another uh, post you had was on focusing on progress not perfection um and how do you avoid getting frustrated as well you know so um what are what are ways that uh, you can me- measure progress but not like get caught up in, in being perfectionistic I have, I normally don't do book recommendations, but there is one that I absolutely love that really covers this topic. And I'll use their framework because I think it's absolutely genius. And if anybody has an opportunity to go get this book, I would say 100% good. It's called The Gap and the Gain. And it's an extraordinary book on how we conceptualize progress. And basically what it is, right, is everybody goes and looks at progress at they have a goal. That goal is over there. Now, that goal may or may not be realistic, but it is the the mind's eye of what we want reality to be. And where I am now to there is the gap. And people constantly measure themselves by the gap. What they never do is look back and look at where they started to see the gain. And anytime you're in that negative place, anytime you're looking at it and you're looking at progress and going, oh, this is stall, this is blah, blah, blah. You're in the gap. You're looking at what is more than likely an unrealistic expectation. And looking at the distance that you are between it and then. And even if you're super close, it doesn't matter because it's always framed as a negative. The best way to go about this is to actually start setting game land. Okay, cool. Like I'm starting this block. Where's my starting point? So I can go back and look and say, all right, cool. Look at the progress. I've and it may be one more rep and it may be five more pounds or it may be, you know, just feeling generally better or whatever it may be. But you got to look at the game and start to measure that as your actual progress and not the distance that you have from your goal as your progress. Phenomenal book. One of the best out there for that mindset kind of thing. Yeah, so it's kind of like making your perspective work for you instead of against you. So kind of setting, is it like mini goals along the way to the, the bigger overarching goal? You can set mini goals. Uh, the, the book itself is pretty much framed in a very business sense. So it's like quarterly goals is the way they go about it. But like in this particular instance, you could look at, you could look at quarterly goals if you're looking at you know lifting over the year. You can look at training blocks and, and start to, to break it apart that way. And in that in that case, so we talk about KPIs occasionally, key performance indicators. You have to pick the things that are important to you, right? Is that your max squat? Maybe. Is that your you know pace on a three mile? Maybe. But you got to pick those KPIs that matter and then have a starting point. This is where I started not two years ago before you had kids and like, you know, all, all of life happened. Like literally your most recent performance of that metric. That's the starting point. And then you train through parts of your block and you can look at the game. The other, the, the, the big mistake people make with this is they try to measure the game from when they were like at peak performance on, in a once in a lifetime performance type thing. And they're like always trying to chase that. No, that's actually, the, you're in the gap. So most recent performance, use that as a KPI and then build build the program forward from there so you can look back at that most recent performance KPI. Yeah, for some people, they, they, they hold on to like their previous best when they were like, you know, no kids, you know, no responsibility. And like totally just like perfect circumstances and they forget like, you know, the gap in between where they are, where they were then to, to now is like, you know, they're like a working professional with kids or like, you know, so many more different responsibilities. And it's like, you might not ever get back there again, but you can definitely make a significant amount of progress um, if you just kind of shift your perspective. Yep. So 
Just one of the, the final questions here, the debate that uh, Kevin Bass brought up about uh, oh. the squat and the deadlift being dangerous, specialist lifts. So he's recommending that most people, they don't, I want to be kind of clear about like, you know, what he said. So I'm pretty sure it was that most people shouldn't squat and deadlift heavy. I think that's what he said. So, you know, if we just, if we just kind of give him the strongest argument or the strongest point, you know, to, to operate from, we'll say, we'll say, you know, so his case is that the average, you know, gen pop person should not lift, you know, two X body weight on the squat or the deadlift, take it away. What, what, what's your opinion on that? I, I would actually find that piece hard to disagree with because it's typically not somebody's actual goal. But when I, I, this, this set the world on fire a couple of weeks ago on Instagram, and I know it's just one of those things. I have no idea who this person was until it finally happened. So there's always a piece of me that's wondering like, wow, this is a really inflammatory thing to say to get a lot of uh, eyeballs on your content. But I have, uh, when I read his article, when I looked at the little, it, it's not much, it's a, it's a small blog. Um, when I looked at it, I, th- there were a couple of things that it jumped out. Uh, and a lot of it, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I try to tune really too closely into language usage and how it's used. And one of the things in particular in there that threw a bunch of red flags for me is, the countless number of disabling injuries occurring across the country, like this really elaborate scare. So that's where I actually want to go into it. Because if you look at the incidence of injury in a sport like powerlifting or in an Olympic weightlifting, their injury rate per thousand hours of activity is extraordinarily low compared to literally every other sport in the world. So the injury rate of this massively debilitating large number is actually really low. And the act, the number is anywhere between 1.0 and 4.4 injuries per 1,000. I, literally, I have it right in front of me, paper from 2021 that went over 11 injury studies within powerlifting and weightlifting. Now, the argument may be, John, these observed trained individuals, right? Now we're going to go into the, the, the science methodology nitty gritty. Yes, 100%. Is that going to skew the evidence? Well, Absolutely. My argument, though, is that, yes, they are trained individuals. They are able to use a higher load and have a higher capacity for using that load. Why do we all of a sudden view gen pop as completely different when their skill set's lower? So the intensity being able to handle is going to be lower. Their risk is all going to be skill dependent. And if, if skill dependency is the largest risk factor of something that is a squat or a deadlift, a functional standpoint, and I, I always hesitate to use that word because it just got like, bastardized for years but like from a functional standpoint don't we want their skill set to be greater we want people to do like general foundational movements with implements that load them appropriately and give them the ability to actually get better at them because i would much rather have you know my grandparents able to pick up a box from a seated position in a much more comfortable way than not so that's that that's my argument to the approach it's the fear-mongering of injury around it sure do I think everybody should lift heavy? <laughs> I don't think it's absolutely necessary. No, I really don't. You look at the the Department of Transportation, the Department of Labor standards in the U.S., like 75 pounds is the most, what, what most people are going to lift in their occupation on a daily basis. Okay. I get it. that guy that gets the, the box from Amazon. That's like team lift. And I'm like, I got this shit. And I take it into the house by myself. Like I'm that nutcase. Okay. I get it. That's my bias. Do I think people need to lift extraordinarily heavy? No. Do I think some of these things are foundational movements? Most effective movements for a reason. And it's like, I think, uh, just the, the word heavy, it's like, it's so individual, you know, like there's some arbitrary guidelines, like, you know, you should be able to bench like your body weight, for example, or you know, deadlift two extra body weight. But like, that's just, that's in general. Like if we're talking about people, our grandparents age, for example, it's like, you know, 75 pounds at 90 years old is it's a lot that's heavy. So that's how much they, sh- you know, should be aiming for. But, you know, maybe they don't get there or maybe they get higher, but it's just an individual response that's needed. And this, yeah, the fear mongering, it's just going to promote inactivity, which is already a huge problem. We need to be promoting the opposite. Here's here's my last and the first time I'm posing this argument. So I'm hope hopefully I formulate this well. If if this is massively like all over the place, you just say, John, shut up. A lot of the things we look at when it comes to physical activity and, and exercise selection for gen pop is for injury risk reduction along the lines of fall risk. Fall risk is still a super prevalent thing. Tons of people die from falling on a regular basis in the United States still. And they fall not because of the fall itself, but because of the injuries sustained in the fall that put them in a position where quality of life decreases substantially and they're not able to live the way they want. You break your femur in a fall. So I've heard the alternatives that people oppose when it comes to like adult squat. 
deadlift, single leg Romanian deadlift, single leg squat. Many of these things that are very difficult to load and also have a very high balance, even if they've got like an, a balance assist or something. My argument is actually with load. I mentioned earlier that loading the skeletal system increases bone mass, bone density, and it's commiserate with load. It's, it's literally proportionate with load. The more load, the more stimulus, more bone density. So if we're looking at that, we want to look at superior loadable exercises to create the adaptation that we want. A single leg Romanian deadlift, and this goes back to like, I think it was Mike Boyle years ago that was like single leg squat superior than a, a back squat or something like that for developing leg strength. Like it's just not loadable in the same way. A single leg Romanian deadlift or a single leg squat or a step up or anything like that is not going to get to the required load for the adaptations that I want to decrease fall risk to help a bone stay intact under the forces of the fall. Because that's the last piece of math we need to really do here. Because the bone actually has to be able to withstand the force from the fall. And the only way to do that is to load it so that it can, can actually sustain those loads. Single leg Romanian deadlift, will it help? Yeah. Is it superior? No. Single leg squat, is it helpful? Is it beneficial? Yes. Is it superior from a loading standpoint? No. I'm going to look at load as one of the biggest factors in health and survivability from a fall, fall than anything else. Because if they fall and they live and they don't break a bunch of bones when they do it. I want to get as strong as possible for as long as possible and, and load is, is the way to do that. And yeah, that whole point about like balance or, you know, variety or, you know, avoiding load it's kind of like well the way around that is you know you do your your loaded exercises and then you just add in the variety of the single leg stuff as well so you get the best of both worlds you know it's mm -hmm. like you get your you get your uh bone density benefits from lifting heavy and then you get your balance benefits from doing your single leg stuff so you get you get it all you know it's like you can't you can have both you know but um to not have getting stronger as the primary goal is just not going to build strong people that are resilient and able to bounce back after a fall. There were a lot out there, though. Hopefully that did make sense. It did, yeah. But there were, yeah, it's definitely an ongoing discussion and something that people have to think about for themselves, like how much, you know, kind of like you said earlier, how much do they really want to incur that risk of, of lifting heavy? And, and what is heavy for them individually, you know, like, so uh, that's something to really think about and consider and talk about with an expert, you know, like a health professional or a coach. Yeah. What is heavy is really important, you know? Like, how many times do you have somebody in the gym with where you work right now go to an actual, like, RPE? Barely if ever. Barely if ever, right? My RPE 9 and somebody else's RP, RPE 9 from, like, a general outlook of what heavy is are going to be substantially different. But using guidelines like rate of perceived exertion, that's why it exists. Heavy is always going to be relative. Heavy to them may not be heavy to you. Maybe it not be, it, or it may be massively heavy. It, it just has to fit what they're actually looking for. Yeah, fit what the individual's preferences and, and desires and goals are. And just on a side note, or PE, it's just a scale used to gauge intensity. Um, and, and the more you lift, the more useful it becomes. And a 10 would be absolutely maximum that you couldn't do any more reps with whatever weight you're using. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, John for a, a fascinating uh, discussion. Is there anything you want to mention, a uh, final message you want to wrap up on before we finish? No, I mean, if anybody has any questions, I'm an open book. Uh, shoot me a message on Instagram. It's at rebuild underscore stronger. Literally, I'm a message away. Like, you got a question, you want to chat, I'm here. You can ask Ross. I was just like, yeah, what's up, man? Yeah. So please, any message you guys have, let me know. Brilliant. I'll attach your, uh, your link in the show notes. Um, so thanks very much for your time, John. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it.